say goodbye to this world. It's going to be a great day, isn't it? Amen. 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 I hope you have your Bibles open, or we'll open them to Mark chapter 11. And uh, put the title here, Hosanna. We'll be talking about Hosanna. That's sort of the key part of the passage here. And we'll be looking at that here in just a moment. We'll read, uh, look again at verses 1 through 11. We've read them together. And um, we'll be looking and see what the Lord has for us here out of these verses. So much in this chapter uh, is pretty amazing. Uh, but let's begin with prayer as we look into God's Word. Our Father God, as we stand here now with our Bibles open before us and seated as well, Lord, we ask that you would speak to us. We ask that you would open our ears that you would open our eyes to see and open our minds to understand. And Lord, that you would open our hearts and feed us and teach us and guide us and instruct us for your glory and for our good, for our church and for this community and for what you have for us to do. So Lord, we pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So as we mentioned, Jesus is on the move going to Jerusalem, and we call this Passion Week in the Bible, this week that begins with the triumphal entry, which was on Palm Sunday. It's called Palm Sunday, this, this incident here in Scripture, this time, because they took the palm leaves and laid them out for Jesus to enter into Jerusalem. And so Jesus was uh, coming into continue to teach and preach, and also to demonstrate different things. In this very chapter here in Mark 11, he goes into the temple and drives out those that were in the outer court of the gent area of the Gentiles, where they allowed Gentiles to come into that outer court, and they were buying and selling, and he drove them out. That happens uh, in this uh, chapter, but also in this passage. It surprised me, going through the book of John, who gives the account of Jesus that has 21 chapters, I think it is in John, that in chapter 12, Jesus enters Jerusalem. And so you've got chapters 12 all the way through 21, 21 uh, all about that last week that happened in the last week of Jesus. And so Jesus did a lot of teaching in these days, day after day after day. Lots of teaching, lots of miracles as well. So this is sort of the beginning of that journey that he took, uh, leading up to the last Passover that he would observe. Those were tremendous days back then. The temple was still in existence. It did not get destroyed until A.D. 70. And this is around A.D. 29, 30. And um, so another 40-something years, uh, the temple was still here. It was active. And many people were traveling from all over around the world even to come to the feast of Passover and unleavened bread. And so Jesus was observing that as well. But what had Jesus been saying to his disciples particularly and then to others? We saw an increasing number of times where Jesus said, the Son of Man, who is Jesus, the Son of Man is going to Jerusalem and he will be arrested. He will be betrayed. He will be tortured and he will be killed. He will rise on the third day. Jesus mentioned that more often and more often. And here he is going to Jerusalem, heading, heading on his way there. And we read that around the Mount of Olives, uh, that which is the mountain that Bethany and Bethphage were both uh, located near that area, he was going to travel each evening and back in the morning from Bethany where he stayed with uh, his dear friends there. And so as he was coming there on this Sunday, he sent two of his disciples ahead, as we read here, and told them to bring back a donkey. And we know that they found a colt of a donkey, or a foal of a donkey, that had never been ridden, a young one. And just as he had told them they would, they'd find it 
They went, and those two disciples go. They do what Jesus said do. They unleashed, untie him, get ready to go, and they said, wait, wait, where are you going with our, our donkey there? And they said, the master has use of him, and they let it go. So Jesus might have made some arrangements before, I don't know, but certainly uh, this was not such an unusual thing. Uh, maybe it will, was certainly unusual in his uh, just knowing what was going to happen here, but uh, that they untied the donkey, they said that he'll be back. I think he, you can read the story in Matthew, Mark, which we're reading, and Luke. And in one of those instances, they said that they implied they would be back soon with the donkeys returning. So they went, they got the donkey, and here comes this donkey down the road, being led by two disciples, and Jesus and the other disciples, and multitudes that were getting larger and larger crowds was, were following him. And so they come up to Jesus, and they bring the donkey that he had sent for. Uh, and so in verse 7, we see that they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on him. So there wasn't a saddle there. I don't know what kind of saddle they would have had anyway. But uh, the disciples took their outer coats, cloaks on, and covered up the donkey and set Jesus or helped Jesus get set up on this donkey according to verse 7. So there were huge crowds here. Uh, many outsiders heading to Jerusalem. Maybe many had been to Jerusalem and had not found lodging. So they're going to the outer areas like Bethany and Bethpage and finding uh, places there as Jesus is coming in. When he's coming in, it's not morning time now. So it's sort of later in the day because as we read, it started getting dark, and so Jesus led his disciples back out of the city, out of the gates to Jerusalem, and, uh, and back over to where they were staying. And so there was a lot of excitement. Remember, Jesus had done miracles everywhere he'd gone, practically, and Jesus had taught, and he had answered questions from the Pharisees and others that, yes, he would answer them, I am. I am the Messiah. I am sent from heaven. Jesus made a lot of claims, and this, these claims were certainly going out and abroad everywhere. And there were thousands coming in and going out of Jerusalem in those days. And Jesus knew that he was the king, but he also knew that he was not the kind of king that most folks were expecting. And so he sends for a donkey. You would think, wow, the Messiah is coming. We're sick and tired of this uh, Roman oppression. We're finally, we're going to throw off the shackles of Rome, and we're going to be free again. The Messiah has come, going to set up the kingdom of God among us in just what we've been waiting for. And then they heard Jesus was the king. And there were many excited about that, ready to honor him and anoint him as king, thinking that he would be like a worldly king. And so the excitement was building. There were some that didn't think he was the Messiah. There were some that didn't think he was certainly going to be the king. But they were excited because they knew they were Jews and something big was happening and they didn't want to miss it. Sort of like when I was growing up a couple of years in my little town, in my little community in the county, we would have a county fair. Uh, the fair would come to town. And for a couple, two or three years when I was about 16 or 17, it came to less than two blocks from my house. And certainly I wanted to know what was going on. It, it was big news for us. In fact, I remember somebody convinced me and my buddy, maybe a brother or two of mine, to take these bumper stickers that advertised Tatma County Fair and go and put them on the bumpers of the cars that were up and down Main Street. I'm trying to remember just, just, this is just another bit of information, I'm trying to remember, but I think the name of that Main Street, yeah, it's Barnard Street, by the way, in case you wonder. <laughs> we, we went, and knowing no better, we took those bumpers, and we peeled the sticking off, and we put those stickers, and we put them on the bumpers, and we made, you know, they, all those folks downtown, and we cut we didn't get very far. And somebody called our hand, what are you doing sticking out of my car? Uh, 
We were just doing what we were told or asked to do. But anyway, so the fair was coming. It was a big thing. And uh, we were able to go and walk around and see all that was going on. Well, it was bigger than the fair uh, leading up to Passover in Jerusalem. And uh, Jesus knew he was not going to be the earthly king. And so he, as had been planned from the ages past, was going to fulfill, of course, many parts of the Old Testament. And in Zechariah, you might want to turn and look there, Zechariah 9, it talks about how the king is going to come riding into Jerusalem someday. And so let's look at that. In Zechariah, Zechariah 9, verse 9 and 10. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Zion had to do with Mount Zion, which was around Jerusalem there. O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on the donkey, a colt, the foal of the donkey, a dad would say a donkey. Verse 10, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He, this king, shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea. And from the river, the Euphrates, river to the ends of the earth. And so Jesus fulfilled this prophecy, and it was very clear. He did it on purpose, riding into Jerusalem with all the multitudes and crowds and, and folks hearing, he's coming, he's coming. And crowds were gathering inside Jerusalem as well. And so he gets on the donkey coming in as king, but not as a conquering king on the stallion, but as a lowly, humble king. Because why? Because he was heading ultimately to the cross. Probably Friday, maybe Thursday. Some debate about that. But near the end on Passover day, he was going to die on the cross. He was coming as a king, meek and lowly. <coughs> I'm glad he came. Amen. I'm glad he came, meek and lowly. I'm amazed. Isn't it surprising? Yeah. But we know now, having the full scriptures, we know that he came humbly. And he came for you and for me. And he certainly is our king. Amen? Amen. King Jesus. Let's say that. King Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Bring, coming in on the donkey of the colt. Bringing peace. And you know what? There needed to be peace because all had sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the sacrifices that they had been offering for the forgiveness of their sins and even once a year the high priest had made on behalf of the people. People knew deep down that the blood that was given on those sacrifices, the blood of bull and goats cannot atone for sins. That's why it had to be done over and over again. Jesus was coming give his blood. He was coming to be the deep, eternal, and last sacrifice. Amen. He was coming as a king, king of glory, king of heaven. Amen. And yet, he took our sins and died as the king. What a contradiction that is, isn't it? Remember that Jesus claimed to be the king, and Pilate <coughs> had been put over the cross, what? King of the Jews. And the Pharisees said, no, don't change that to say, he said he was king of the Jews. He said, no, I've written what I'm going to write. It's written. He is king of the Jews. He didn't really mean that, and yet it was the truth, no less. So Jesus often quoted the Old Testament, and here he comes demonstrating the Old Testament, writing on the colt of the donkey. Now look at uh, verse 8. Many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Where did that idea come from? That was a tradition. That was a way of honoring somebody's pathway, particularly a conquering king or a heroic king who had maybe saved the day. 
That was a way of showing honor and respect. And many of them did that. <coughs> yeah, later they cried, crucify him, crucify him later in the week. But they were as sincere as they could have been at that time, possibly, I think, with what they knew was going on. And so they did that in verse 9. Then those who went before and those who followed cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed, excuse me, blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You can read that in Matthew 21. You can read it in, here in Mark 11 and in John chapter 12. And they all mention this incident in the life of Jesus. And they all quote part of what was being said. Now why were they saying these things? Because they were Jews. Because they had been taught the Old Testament. And there were prophecies about this. And most of this came from a chapter in Psalm, <coughs> or one of the Psalms, that they used often. And it has many quotations in it. If you sit down this afternoon and read through Psalm 118, you'll find many familiar phrases in there that have been quoted even in the New Testament. And this is one of them. They were quoting things that they normally did to celebrate at festivals and at glorious occasions. And so they were celebrating, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. But what does that word mean? Well, for us in English... When the people translated, the translators translated from the original language of the Greek here and New Testament, they translated it just transliterally. They just literally used the same word. That's why if you go to visit a foreign country that speaks another language and your name is Wendy, unless they think about the wind and all that, they're probably not going to give, call her by their language. They're probably going to call her Wendy. Well, that's easier, and she'll know they're talking to her, okay, whatever the name is. And that's what happened with this word Hosanna. It wasn't changed like the word work or the work, word table or whatever is changed from one language to the other. When the English translators put it into the English, New English Bible, they used the same word, Hosanna. And in the Greek, it meant salvation is coming or salvation has come. And so when they translate it, here it is in our Bibles, our English Bibles, Hosanna. So I wonder, you know, what did it mean in Greek, where they get it from, where you can look up in a Greek dictionary, look up the word Hosanna, and you'll find out that it's the same exact word that was in the Old Testament, Psalm chapter 118. The same word. So what the English did in trans, literally translating, putting it, from the Greek to the English. That's what the Greeks had done years before uh, when they had written and quoted this, this passage and the Jews had used the same word, Hosanna. It was the same word that was used in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. So that word has been around quite a while. Hosanna. In fact, I was looking up the definition of how they did it. You know how they spell different words different ways. In reading, the Hebrew is Hoshi, Hoshiana. Hoshiana. So, Hosanna, okay, however they do all that, I don't know how to pronounce Hebrew, but all of this comes from the, a lot of, this main phrase comes from Psalm 118 in verse 25, where it says, Hosanna. And the word Hosanna has always meant, from the days of the Hebrews, salvation come, send us salvation, salvation is coming. In other words, in the future, we're going to be saved. And as the Greeks translated it then, it got translated from the people that used it. And the New Testament Jews, they used the word Hosanna. It slowly came to mean not that salvation is coming, but salvation has come. Because the Savior came. And so when you hear somebody saying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to the king, the, the heir of the king of David, his kingdom. Then they're talking about salvation coming. Save us. And now it is, we're saved. It's here. Our Savior has come. The ark, the Calvary has arrived. You know, we're saved. We're rescued. 
What a glorious truth that is. Amen? All lay in darkness. All men of sin. And Jesus came and on the cross, he bore all of our sins. They became his. And he died for every one of them. None of them split through. Praise the Lord. And he paid for them all. And rose again as the victim. And so, uh, they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. And they mentioned King David here because the prophecy was that the Messiah would come through the lineage of Judah and through the lineage particularly of David. And so they, many were excited. I don't know what the disciples fully believed. You know, they were, they were still not comprehending everything. They were trying, but they get this wrong and get that wrong. And maybe they were looking, maybe some of them thought, yeah, we're going to throw the Romans out of here and we're going to have a new kingdom set up like God's always promised. And eternity is coming here and we're going to have heaven on earth forever and ever. Because the king, the son of David, has come. Hosanna in the highest. Our Savior is here. Hosanna. Well, that was the cry. And when you read Matthew and when you read Luke, then you'll read that there were many, many children there gathered around, but also adults as well. And so the children were crying, Hosanna. They they were how they know that? Because they did a good job in training their children up in the ways of the Lord. They were serious about teaching their children to know God, to know the truth of the Word of God. They memorized it. They taught their children to memorize it. You know, we've gotten far away away from that today, haven't we? God help us. May God help the families and our churches to reinstitute and get dedicated back to that. And raise children up in the ways of the Lord. But many of them there, they knew it. They might not have known a lot of other things, but they knew Scripture. We went to uh, Uganda, went to this little school called King of Kings. You might find them on Facebook, King of Kings in Kampala, Uganda. They had a little school there, and those little kids packed in. I guess there were probably 120 in there, maybe, something like that. And one of the little boys stood up because they were going to quote scripture for us. I thought, this is going to be good. We sat down, and for at least 20 minutes, not exaggerate, they didn't have a ball game to hurry off to. You know, you know, you know they, for at least 20 minutes, that little kid, he would say, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust him, take off that off to it. As soon as they got through, he'd say, Genesis 1, 1 through 6. In the beginning, God. Scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture. These little kids lived in the slums. They lived where the overflow of the, the swampy area that when the heavy rains came in the hills of Kampala, it would wash everything down to this swampy area. Of, there were no sewage system in the whole city, okay? And so they lived down in that lower part of the swamp where the big old, big old pipes were that carried water back and forth and other things. Uh, they, they were down in the slums. What a beautiful sight it was to see those kids. Many of them from Muslim families. They were learning about our Jesus. They were learning the ways of God. They knew the scriptures. I believe they could say them all still today. Okay. King of Kings School. What a, what a blessing. And so as these people were praising the Lord, it was right for them to praise the king coming. It was right for them to say so. And the Bible tells us to let the redeemed say so. We who are the redeemed these days should say so. We should say it over and over again. Praise the Lord. I'm saying thank God for salvation. Thank God for the cross. Thank God for his mercy and grace. And his mercy endureth forever. Singing and speaking and praising God for the glorious truth that one day, when we're in heaven as Christians, as believers, we will be shouting it over and over again. We're going to be praising God for salvation in heaven. We're going to be praising Him for loving us in heaven. We're going to be praising Him for sacrificing and giving His only Son. And gave him up to suffer and die for us. We're going to be praising him and thanking him forever in heaven. Just read through Revelation. Yeah. And look in chapter 5 and look in chapter 9 and look in many other chapters. 
where it says, and the multitude did this, and the 24 elders did this, and everybody that was there did this. They were praising God for that very thing. I believe he deserves the praise right here in the former Memorial Baptist Church. Amen. I believe he deserves it in your home, in your car, in your truck, in your neighborhood. He deserves our praise. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. It's interesting also that near, uh, that was uh, verse 26, mainly about Hosanna, that in verse 23, it talks about the Messiah coming and it says, it is marvelous in our eyes. Psalm 118. It is marvelous in our eyes. We've talked about our eyes, haven't we? So that we're not blind, but so that we can see. It's just it's a wonderful chapter. Psalm 118. And so Jesus tells us, even today, I'm your king. I've done this for you. And there's still time, even this morning, there's still time for you to come and receive my forgiveness. For you to let go of the other side and come and join my side, my eternal side, my redeemed side, my forgiven side, and that's Jesus. We have to reject our own allegiance to self and to this world, don't we? We have to reject that. And you know, I just know that God helps us do that. Because why would you or I, on our own, why would we reason with those little brains we have, excuse me, I'll say my little brain, and and reason and conclude, well, you know what? The smartest thing in the world for me to do is to go join Jesus. You think I could make that conclusion on my own? Do you think you made it on your own when you did come to Jesus? Uh -huh. God opened our eyes to see the truth. He convinced us. He pulled us to himself. He drew us to himself. And we gladly said, yes, I'll let go. You know, there's some commercial on TV about... Uh, you know, it, it's an aggravating thing. Some of us know about that when we have uh, red patches on our skin. You know, we sort of don't like for people to see it and, and so forth. And so they advertise some kind of uh, drug for that. Um, and so you've got this, uh, this guy sitting here with his girlfriend, teenager, and he's got those things. But he's taking that medicine. So now he's not worried about it. He, he'll wear a short sleeve shirt now. <laughs> but that, that uh, the other part of him is worried about what people think. But he doesn't have to do that anymore. This medicine is covering up for him and helping him be well. And so he just shirts off that, you know, other, this is commercial, okay? And shirts it off and he goes on because he's free. He, his skin is not ugly anymore, you know? Well, uh, how did I get there? I don't know. Um, but uh, we, we don't just conclude on our own that we're going to shirk off our old ways and shirk off living for ourselves and that we've concluded, we've come to our own conclusion that we're coming to Jesus. We've made the right decision, and we have. But we don't, we don't conclude it ourselves. We don't figure it out inside ourselves. We come because he draws us, and he opens our eyes, and we see it for ourselves. And we see why would I not trust Jesus? Why would I not come to a God who loves me like that? Why would I want to stay where I have been all my life so far, where there is no peace? I, there may be money, may not be, but there's no peace, there's no joy, there's no fullness inside. I'm coming to Jesus just as I am, without one plea, except I'll plead that his blood was shed for me. O Lamb of God, I come. That's the kind of king we have. And Jesus came as that kind of king. And in Revelation chapter 19, let me read what it's going to be like that day. The apostle, the apostle and disciple John uh, describes that this king doesn't look like the expected king back in those days. But in uh, Revelation 19, 11 through 16, and I saw heaven open. And behold, a white horse, and not a dog, a white horse, and he who sat on it was faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges, and he makes war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He's clothed with a robe 
dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. You know, previously, God spoke to us in many ways, but in these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he's made heir of all things. And even in heaven, he is known as the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty, squeezing out the grape juice. Jesus the King, pressing the fierce wrath of God on the enemies of God. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings. King of kings and Lord of lords. He will be coming not as a king on a donkey, which he is the king of peace. I'm thankful for peace in my life and the peace that he brought to this world. But he will, he will come as a king and when he appears in the skies, all will already be settled. It will be too late to change signs. I'm glad that I belong to the Lord. You know, the Bible tells us to rejoice because now you are sons of God, sons and daughters of God. You behold, now we are the children of God. And when we're saved, the Holy Spirit tells us in Romans 8, 16, he bears witness to us that we are the children of God. But when the king comes, the sides will have been decided. And behold, now is today is the acceptable time. As 2 Corinthians 6 says, Today is the day of salvation. For the king came to Jerusalem back in around 29 AD. The king came and he was honored. He was worshipped. They rejoiced in his coming. Some people said, you hear them say this about you? Why don't you correct them? And he said, no, no, I'm not going to correct them. If I was going to stop them, then those rocks would be crying out what they've been crying out. Because the truth about me is going to be known. Jesus had been sent to this earth to reveal the Father. And he said, everything I say and everything I do, I get it from the Father. And one of them asked him, well, what do we know about the Father? He said, oh, if you know me, you know the Father. And I've come to reveal him. And I'm the perfect expression of who the Father is. You want to know what God looks like? Look at me. Look at Jesus. You, you want to know what matters to God? Pay attention to what matters to me, Jesus said. He came and revealed the Father. And he rode into to Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, revealing the promise of the Father, the grace and mercy and love of the Father, who wanted to send salvation. And so it was right for them to say, Hosanna in the highest. Salvation has come. God has intervened. He has sent his only son to us. What a glorious day that was. And then Jesus looked around. He got inside and he got to the temple. And he looked around. I think that is verse 11. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went back out. He went out to Bethany with the twelve. And he will return the next morning on Monday morning. But he has already come. He came to earth. And he will return someday. We have a glorious hope, don't we, in God. I trust that you know him as your Savior. And that you know that you know him as your Savior. That's the most important thing to take care of. Of all things in life. Let's be ambassadors. Let's witness. Let's testify. And when somebody comes to this church, may they see you loving on Jesus. May they see you worship to him. May they hear you and see the expression of your face that when we sing praise the Lord, praise the Lord, that you're really praising the Lord. And when somebody comes in the, into this church, that they will be motivated and drawn to worship the same God that we worship. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Oh, what a glorious God you are. What a glorious Lord. Thank you for your mercy and your grace.
and your glory, and your power, and your provision for us. Thank you indeed, Lord. We love you. Thank you. We ask that you help us to be more diligent in praising you and sharing the truth of the gospel with all that we can. Have your own way, Lord. Draw us to you now, even now, as we respond to you and what you say to us. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Thank you.